Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. It's kind of exciting to see all those children going out to their classes like that. Yet you need to rejoice when you see that. There are churches in the country a lot bigger than ours who would give their left arm to see that happen. Before we turn to the subject of the New Testament church, there's a few things I want to run by you. Um, we try to keep you fully aware of what's going on in Uganda as the boys keep us informed and we've shown you some of the pictures as they prepared the land so we don't need to show that to you again but one of the things that <clears throat> is really important to what they do there is the um, clean water more people die there of water related illnesses than anything else and so I thought you might like to see the two or three pictures that we have of, uh, of the, what the water well looks like and is fully functioning and people in the community are now using it if they're ready to show you that. That's what the water well looks like and see the... <laughs> Patrick does like pictures. <laughs> so they're there uh, just because I wanted to, to see that the water well was functioning. And so the community people, all they have to do is bring a container and they have clean water. And so that's that's why I wanted you to see that. Eddie's looking at you. You can see his teeth with his red hat shining there. And uh, But uh, I've asked Uncle Alex, who raised them at Good Samaritan Children's School and Children's Home, to wait and, and till they got there to start doing things because it is their goal and hope in life that this that the church that will be functioning there pretty soon uh, will be the first of many that they hope to start in Uganda in their lifetime. So, uh, and I just wanted to keep you all aware where we have the money and are sending sixteen thousand dollars tomorrow uh, to uh, to them to purchase their first vehicle because they need some transportation. It's a used vehicle that they'll be using to be able to get from where they're living uh, back and forth. So I wanted you to see that and then try to keep you updated as best I can. Several of you have indicated that if we are able to go to Uganda next March, because we're looking at leaving on the 3rd, about 2.30 in the afternoon from Columbus, we get there on the evening of the 4th and on the 5th, uh, Patrick will and his fiance will be having what they call in Africa an introduction. For them, the introduction is for the people who live there. That is the wedding. But since they're Christians, the 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 Christian uh, uh, wedding will take place the following Sunday, and so we'll stay there for that on the 13th, and then that night we'll head back home. And in, the, in, in between, we'll visit several different places. And if all things being equal, we'll actually get kind of what I call a poor man's safari. You get to go see a bunch of elephants and lions and all that good stuff. And 
So I wanted to run that by you. We're in the process here of church of upgrading several things. Um, and and we've, had, we've saved the money and are able to pay for them as we do them. This week, God willing, there will be two new HVAC units put, units put, not Unix, units put on the, uh, in the atrium area. Um, last night when people came in and they turned the hot water on, it came out as black as coal set because we had to, the water heater had actually accumulated a bunch of junk and we had it cleaned out and we forgot to drain it good before they used it last night and the women came in screaming and hollering. So that's what women do when the black water comes out of the, uh, the hot water heater. So, and um, then the other thing we're doing is we're in the process of establishing a church library. I'll have some pictures for you next week so you can see it. And um, we've got several hundred books in it already, but it's, uh, and we've got <clears throat> beautiful new bookcases to put them in back there. So, and with the parking lot and other things, uh, all of that added together would be, uh, shall we say, probably far in excess of $50,000 in upgrading. And we appreciate your generosity. You've done really good. Tomorrow, 51 years ago, we had our first meeting as a church. There were a handful of us who got together, and, uh, and we had just a few things that were priority. One of them was the, and that was 51 years ago, but the problem was there then. It's only gotten worse. We said we want to emphasize the unity of the family. We would like for families to sit together, to worship together, so that, and so that uh, little boys can see their dad worshiping the Lord and know that that's what he's to grow up to be. Little girls can see their mother worshiping the Lord and know that that's what they're to grow up to be. See, the breaking up of the home has really been a, a tragedy for our kids growing up. Uh, I've tried to have fun with it off and on, and I paid for it when I got home, but uh, trying to laugh about why couples should stay together, because most of the things that, uh, most of the reasons why people divorce have to do with individuals who are always, sometimes there are, there's, there's always the tendency to blame the other person. And nothing is ever accomplished. When people come to see me with marital problems, the first time they come, they get to say anything they want to. They can talk about their spouse. And, and, and to be very honest with you, I don't pay much attention to it. Because you can't change your spouse. You can make them mad or madder, but you can't change them. And so what is required when you come for counseling at my house, after the first session, the only person that you're allowed to talk about is you. Because until you turn the light on yourself to see what have I done and how can I be better, nothing will ever get better. And both, prop, both the husband and the wife have to do that. And it's the same thing with when there's teenagers wanting to start war at home, and most of them do at one time or another. You have the same thing. Until that teenager is willing to turn that light upon themselves to see what they have done to create that stress in the home, nothing is ever really accomplished. You can threaten to beat them with a stick. doesn't help any, but you can threaten it anyway. I did. So uh, the... Uh, the we emphasize, and, and the, 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 requ the, the need is still there for strong families. You see, the family existed far before the church. The first thing that God did with humans is to put together a family. That should be, at the, that should be number one in your priorities. How do we keep good communication? How do we develop spiritual strength within our home so that when trouble comes, we're ready? So that was how we started. And we also started, believe it or not, and we'll get to this in a minute, we started uh, uh, 
with really excellent music. Ralph Harrison was a tremendous musician and he handled that for us. And the singing at church at times when we were using the Seventh-day Adventist building was so good that they didn't want me to preach. Now, so if you want to get to the place where you don't have to listen to me, you know what you have to do. The text that we have, Matthew wants us to talk about the New Testament church. And we're talking about the principles that God laid down for the, for the origination and the function of the New Testament church. Israel existed to make the world around them aware that there was one God and who he was. The New Testament time came along and the Old Testament law then became uh, something of the past and we were emphasized that we're saved by grace. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and, and what really it boiled down to was this. In the Garden of Eden, Satan stole God's creation. When God created it, the scripture said, he looked at it and said, this is good stuff. Even when he created man and woman and placed them there in the garden to be gardeners, that was their job, he said it was good. But Satan stole that from him, and the church is here to get back everything we can that belongs to God and to give it back to him. And we start, believe it or not, with ourselves. We give ourselves to God for him to use in achieving his purposes. We'll talk about that some too. The New Testament church was a church that was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a difference between what took place in the Old Testament and what took place, takes place in the New. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God didn't indwell many, if any, people. God would give people, probably the one that you would know best would be someone like Samson, who was an ornery cuss. But, when, but God was using him to preserve Israel and to keep it from being overrun by the Philistines. And so what would happen is the Spirit of God would come upon him for the purpose of carrying out what God wanted done. And when the task was over, the Spirit of God withdrew. But in the New Testament era in which we live, this, when, when an individual repents of their sins and comes to the Lord and, and we bury the old guy, we call that in baptism, we, we bury him and he's dead and gone and you're a new person. And that first breath that you have when you come up out of the baptistry is indication of the fact that the Spirit of God is inhaled into your very being with this promise that's in the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So the difference is you see in the Old Testament, God came upon and then would withdraw. But in the New Testament, he comes within us and stays there. Even though at times we have a tendency to think, you know, uh, God isn't there, but we're allowing our feelings to overcome the promises of God. Because there are times in our life when we know that we're not behaving too well or not feeling too well where we think God has just up and left us. But you're, you're basic on... On, on your feelings rather than on the Word of God. Because when you look at this in the fourth chapter, start down at verse 31 of the book of Acts, it says, After they prayed, the place where they're meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word boldly. I guess that's where Megan gets her bold movement. I don't know. If it did, it worked on her. He's a bold little booger. So what happened then, you have three different words that are used in regard to the Spirit of God, each of them emphasizing a different thing. If you look at your outline, you'll see that in 1 John, second chapter, there's a lot of talk about the anointing. The church today on television and other places really abuse this. What you need to know is there's 
one anointing for the Christian. That's it. When David was a little boy in the Old Testament and Samuel came from north of Jerusalem down five miles south of Jerusalem to Bethlehem, he looked at his daddy named Jesse and he said, Jesse, I need to see your sons because I'm going to anoint one of them as the next king of Israel. The older brothers went by and he said, is this it? And he said, no, I got a kind of a little runt out here looking after the sheep. He said, bring me the runt. Us little guys always get elevated. So he brings him in, and he, and he has a, a, a cow horn here full of oil, olive oil. He pours that oil on his head, and he says, you're to succeed Saul as the next king of Israel. He was anointed, which meant that he had been selected by God and that God was going to equip him with the presence of his Holy Spirit to carry out his assignment. That's exactly what it means. And so that's the reason this word anointed is used because they were all familiar with the word. It means that God has selected you. So, and the Holy Spirit is the anointing of a Christian, which means that you have been selected, adopted into God's family, and he's going to use you and assign to you responsibilities for carrying out his will. The other word that's used is in the fifth chapter of the first, or in the fifth verse of the first chapter of the book of Acts, and he uses the word that you you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here, the word baptism, the word baptism, uh, was a common word that was used in the Greek language by everybody. When you washed a dish and you pushed it under the water to to clean it, you, the, a Greek lady would say she had baptized that dish. We we've associated it just with religion, but it wasn't. It was a common term used in everyday life. It was if you if you dyed the, your clothes. You took and you pushed the clothes down in for the dye to, to go through the fabric. That was the, the person doing that would say they had baptized it. So it was a common. And, and what happens when you baptize, you push it under and the water overwhelms. In this particular text, had they asked me, and they didn't for some reason, that's supposed to have some humor in it. It, it says that in that fifth verse, it says, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, which meant that the Holy Spirit would overwhelm the individual and be the dominant influence in their life. So the Spirit of God then overwhelmed the individual, for the, and that was the whole church. And so that was the term that was used there. And then in the, in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, he uses another term in regard to the Spirit of God upon us. And he says, it's, you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. Now that word sealed is, is kind of like an envelope that you, that you lick and, you, and then you stamp and you close and you take to the post office and you mail. Then they would, everything, there was no post office, but they had runners who would take it. You'd take a, 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 some, um, they didn't have paper, that maybe animal skin, and you would roll it up. And then you would take some candle wax on it, and then you would stamp it, and the stamp would indicate who sent it. So he was saying that the Holy Spirit coming into your life is visible proof. It's the stamp. It's the seal of the fact that you, are belo that you belong to the person whose name is on the seal, and that name is Jesus. So he uses these different terms to, to shed a little bit different light on, on the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Then he said to the early apostles, because the they didn't have their Bible, they just had the Old Testament. They didn't have any of what we have today. And so he said the Holy Spirit to his apostles is going to overwhelm you and fill you and help you know what is the will of God so that you can write it down for people like us. And so they were, that was their job. Francis Schaeffer said this better than some of you old timers who studied a little may know what I'm talking about. Francis Schaeffer was a, was a great theologian and an influence in the church in the first half of the 20th century. Anyway, what he, what he said was, uh, the, here's the flow, and this is his term, here's the flow of the will of God. 
What we have to do is we want to move ourselves into what God is wanting to accomplish. That's, that's what it's about. And that's what he means when he says doing the will of God. It isn't, tell, it isn't telling God what we want done. It's us trying to find out what he wants done and let him use us to accomplish it. That's his will, not ours. Even Jesus said as a human being, Father, not my will, but thine be done or yours be done. And so we as Christians, empowered by the Holy Spirit, set aside for his purposes and his use, are, have been the, the presence of the Word of God and the Spirit of God to assist us in, in, in moving in the direction God wants to go and us stepping in that, in that flow of the will of God. And the Spirit of God is essential for that purpose. But that's exactly what the church is to do, is to get into the flow of the will of God. We have a tendency, and all of us do, because we live in this world, we have a tendency at times to let the political and economic situation of the world be our primary concern. The early, and, and, and I understand that because I I'm fit into that category at times too. But the, but the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his will. That's the first priority. And we, most of the time, fail at that. We have a tendency to put the local economic and political needs above seeking first the kingdom of God. The result of that has been the church's influence in the world is less today than maybe it's ever been since its founding. And it's because we have allowed ourselves to be more worldly than we are spiritual. And if we want to see something really good happen in our world, because the whole world was changed when the church blossomed and grew, the whole Roman world, which stunk really, was changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ours can be changed too. But you can't seek to change it politically and economically and expect it because this side will get in, they'll promise you a bunch of things and not do it. The other side gets in, they promise you a bunch of things and they don't do it. So what have you gained? But if you change people from the inside out and they seek the kingdom of the will of God, things are going to change for the better. And it's that simple that God laid it out for us and he said, you know, get with it, guys. The New Testament church, too, was a singing church. I mentioned that Ralph Harrison had been just magnificent in doing that when our church first started. He used the congregation as a choir, and it worked beautifully. I mean, the music at times, as I said, was we had people coming down the aisle wanting to be a Christian before I preached. I thought that was an insult because the singing was so good. And the, and the words of the music were absolutely he, had caref he would carefully select them in conjunction with what we were preaching. For instance, if it were the church, there's a, there's a hymn that is written that is magnificent when it comes to understanding the nature of the church, and you sing about it. It's called, The Church is One Foundation. It's Jesus Christ our Lord. He is, I don't know, I think we got the words to it up there somewhere for those of you who are uh, not well informed and under 20. Just, just look at these words. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. If from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride, and with his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. That's as good of, of, of a poem that expresses the, tent, the nature of the gospel as you'll ever see. And so those are the things that Ralph would select, and, and we want to get back to, you know why they, I helped write a book with Paul Benjamin years ago on church growth. We concluded that churches quit growing when they quit doing what they were doing when they were growing. Now just listen to that, it's that simple. Because we have a tendency, you know, when you get what, some quasi-successful, you, you quit doing what it took for you to grow. We're committed as a staff to start doing, getting back to doing what we were doing when we were growing. 
and, and it'll take some time to do that, and you all will have to help us. But we're headed in that direction, and the singing of the congregation will be integral in bringing that to pass. Somebody said to me the other day, nobody wants to hear me sing. Oh, yeah, God does, and, uh, and we don't even matter. I'm not much of a singer, but I'm telling you, I can flat get with it when everybody else is with it, you know. It kind of drown, when I get drowned it out, I can, I, can, I can hop to it then. And I think all of us are that way. And, and we need to look forward to the day when we just literally lift the roof in praises to God. Because singing is you telling God what's on your heart and praising Him for it. And it doesn't matter about the circumstances of life. We have a tendency to, as, as physical human beings to, we, we don't mature enough or haven't to, because we still let these circumstances be the primary thing in our life. And the result is usually unhappiness. But the early church, the Apostle Paul and Silas when they were in prison, is an excellent illustration for that. These guys were thrown in jail and they were falsely accused. So you can see, they should have been just whining and saying, oh, they didn't do me right. And these suckers were singing and praying in jail. Now, it isn't like the jails today. Our jails today are, are just a, a, a pretty nice uh, holiday inn, you know. And the guys have it pretty well. Food is free. Da-da-da-da-da. The jail then, if you were to go to Israel with me, there's that right close to the temple mount there's a church building there and the image of it is it's it's the church building that's built over the place where they said that the rooster crowed when peter messed up and denied the lord and that church building covers a a, a, a jail you have to go down three layers of steps to get to where the jail was because the jails then were like a well that had been dug down and at the bottom of it, they would dig out little places where they could lay. The only way they got food and water was whoever's in charge to put it in a bucket and drop it down to them. And if you didn't behave very well, you didn't get any buckets. And so those things were just awful. They were pits, literally pits. And so Paul and Silas were there, and, they, and there was an earthquake and they were able to, uh, and, and, the, and the prison, the law of Rome said, you let a prisoner escape and you pay whatever penalty they had. If they were there for a death penalty, you die. And so they were pretty careful about, and the apostle Paul yelled and said, they'd been singing and having a big time in jail. And there were other prisoners listening. And finally, Paul hollered and said, hey, don't kill yourself. We're all here. We haven't gone anywhere. And then he, he preached the gospel, and he baptized the cockeyed jailer, if you remember correctly. So it wasn't the circumstances of life that brought great joy. It was knowing that you were doing the will of God and that God approved. And that's not a bad situation. We'll end up there in a little bit. The New Testament church was not only a singing church, it was a praying church. If you noticed that when I said that when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, it was after they prayed. I'm telling you, they prayed before they did everything. The Jews, even today, the Orthodox Jews, when they sit and eat, they pray before and after the meal. They pray first one in faith that, that, that mom and you know how to cook, and afterwards they prayed either thanking God or, or, or asking God to give them a new mama. I don't know how that worked out. But anyway, they, they still do. They pray before and after each meal. They prayed about everything. So they, they, were, they were a praying church. Now, what we, what we need to get straight in your mind, prayer is mostly misunderstood because we pray it as selfish human beings rather than spiritual people. The primary purpose of prayer, we've already talked about the flow of the will of God. The primary purpose of prayer is to help the Spirit of God help us move into the flow of the will of God. It is not doing what we want, but trying to help, have the Holy Spirit help us to find out what God wants and how we do it. That's the primary purpose of prayer. Oh, will we at times when, we, when we're in real trouble cry out? Sure, and that's okay. 
But it's not the primary purpose of prayer. God's will will not be done until we ask the Holy Spirit to assist us in finding the flow of the will of God and helping us get in it and carrying it out. That's what, that's what it's purposely all about. One of the beautiful illustrations of that is in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. You see that they all, if you, if you take the time to read that whole 20th chapter, you'll find out that the Apostle Paul had spent more time in the city of Ephesus than any of the other places other than maybe Jerusalem itself because he grew up and was educated there. But he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. And that place has been, the, the primary street has been restored. <laughs> the outdoor toilets have been restored, believe it or not. And, and uh, uh, because it was a, a fancy big deal there for people to see that they had running water even then. So uh, they, Paul had spent all that time there. And the Spirit of God had, had said, well, there are two things. Number one, the, the people, the Christians in Jerusalem were having a horrible time. They were starving to death because in a Jewish community, if you became a Christian and said Jesus is the Messiah, the other Jews in that community refused to sell you food. They had a mandate. That's the term they use now, politically. They had a mandate, don't do anything to help the Christians. And they were starving, literally starving to death. And so, and, and who was the one thing, who were the people on the face of the earth that the Jews hated worse than anybody? Gentiles. And the apostle Paul, God called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he went to Gentile churches, the people the Jews hated the most. He went to Gentile churches, took up a big offering. It was so big that he had to have a whole crew go with him to protect him, to keep him getting his head knocked off, somebody stealing it, to take with him back to help feed the people who were starving in Jerusalem. And so they, you know, these, and so the Apostle Paul says, folks, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem and I need to meet with the leaders of the church at Ephesus. And so these household churches, they didn't have church buildings, household churches, all the leaders came together and met him. And he preached until midnight, if you remember. Eutychus fell out the window. And, and so he, he preached until midnight. And then he said, guys, I've, I've told you all that the Lord wanted me to tell you. And I'll probably never see you again. And so uh, he said... And they wept and they prayed together. And they just and, and then the apostle, you know, left and got on a boat and went back to and with his other with traveling companions and went back to Jerusalem where he was arrested. They they were they prayed together about everything. We used to have and I'm not promoting that at all, I'm not certain what it really accomplished. But when I grew up uh, every Wednesday, we had what we call prayer meetings. And uh, they weren't always prayer meetings. Usually they were a Bible study that at the end you prayed. And I always went to those things. And the reason I went is because Mother and Daddy had a rule that if you went to prayer meeting, you could have the car on Thursday go to Lucky Buck Night at the movie in, uh, in, across the river in Ohio <laughs> the next day. And we had a crowd of people. We had that old 31 Model A Ford, see, it would actually run if you could mix kerosene and gasoline. It backfired a lot and made a lot of noise. But you had a heavy running board. Heavy. I mean, you could take a hammer and hit the fender and it wouldn't dent the thing. And so all of the teenagers would jab on because you could get... As many as you could get in a vehicle, you could get in the drive-in theater for a dollar. It was called Lucky Buck Night. And they would all say, oh, my goodness, here, they, here comes that bunch from Germantown. There'd be as many as 12 or 15 of us hanging on the fender, sitting on the fenders, hanging on the running board, and the ones squashed in the middle there. And the best deal was, because I, I was too young to drive, my brother would drive, and if there were some good-looking girls, they'd even have to sit on your lap. I mean, it was a winner all the way around. Everybody, everybody benefited as a result of it. So we don't do that anymore. And, I, and, and one of the things that we have to do if we're able to achieve what Matthew has laid out for us to do in becoming disciples and not just, and not just churchgoers, 
what the New Testament taught when Jesus come to me and learn of me. That's what is a disciple is. So we want to do a better job of educating and preparing people. And that's, that's what we're moving toward here at church. The church was also a generous church. I've all already indicated that because when the Gentiles, you know, were very generous in taking up an offering for the, they call them the saints. And by the word, the word saint, S-A-I-N-T, singular, is never in Scripture. The people who publish the Bibles will say Saint Paul, but that's never in Scripture. The word hagios is always plural. They're always referred to the saints. Why? Because God is not a respecter of persons. He sees all of us as equally important. The guy sitting on the platform in the eyes of God is no more valuable or important in his eyes than the guy who's sitting back there who can't wait to go to the toilet. You know, it, 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 we have a tendency sometimes to miss that. So the New Testament church was, a, was a, a really a generous church, and there's, there's interesting quest, situations here about it. Here in that, for, in that fourth chapter where we read earlier about the Holy Spirit coming, if you, if you look at that starting down what, after the Spirit of God came in verse 32, listen to this now. This is how generous they were. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Now get this, verse 34. There were no needy persons among them. Now that doesn't say, that they. Were, you know, we have people call here every week. Can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? One thing we do not do is we do not help with transportation, with vehicles. If you've got a broken down vehicle, you better get you some new shoes because if you expect us to help you, you're going to walk. You just can't get into that. That, that, that bucket does, has, has got a hole in it. It's, it's nothing that can be. We, we do not get there. But if, but if, and, and we always say we take care of our own family first. Individually and corporately as a church. Why? Because the Bible says, concerning an individual family, he who cares not for his own is worse than the infidel. That's a pretty hard saying. So that number one thing is, you take care of your family. And then the church is the family of God. And so you take care of your people first. If there's anything left over, okay, we can help folks some. If we, but you always take care of you. And the number one thing we look for is food. We don't want anybody hungry. Why? Because in the scripture here, that was the number one thing they had. They even sold some of their possessions, their land, and they said, and brought the money and laid it at the feet of the apostles who were responsible for distributing it to the people who were hungry. And there were a lot of them who were. And the church needs to be generous in order for us to take care of folks. And you say, well, we have people like that today. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Not many, but we do. So the church was a generous church. And as a result of that, God really blessed them. It really bothers me that we have to spend so much money on maintaining facilities. But I don't know any way around it, you know. And so that's just kind of the way we do things anymore. And there's still a lot, but we've made a lot of progress in the last 18 months or so in getting things upgraded. We, and, and I tried to mention it to you. And it's cost a chunk of money. Each of those units, HVAC units in the atrium, and it takes two of them, are $10,000 installed. And getting rid of the old one, putting in a new one, it's each of them, so it's twenty grand. Now... The New Testament church did something too. It was what I like to, I use the term here, they practice what I call extreme grace. Because we have a tendency sometimes to be a little judgmental where we should be just the, let me, let me tell you about an old guy that probably comes to mind, came to my mind first when I was talking about this. Some of you old timers would remember Andy Rhodes. Andy Rhodes had, was a railroad bum most of his life. He learned a little bit of taking care of shoes, putting on heels and soles and so on. And down next to the restaurant, underneath where Bill Lewis's office was, 
he worked there in that little shoe shop. And Bill would go down and talk to him. Now, Andy was a world-class alcoholic. He'd been to AA meetings all over the United States because he was a railroad bum. I, we, were, we got a new little bun coffee maker, and Andy says, you know, that, that was George Bunn. I know him. I said, you know George Bunn? He said, yeah, I went to AA meetings with him in Springfield, Illinois. So, and and, and, and we, we got to know Andy really well. So Bill got him coming to church. And he would come to church. And every once in a while, we'd have a testimony, and he'd get up. Now, I'm an old alcoholic. It's the same lead that they had in AA. I'm an old alcoholic. And he'd get up and say about the kids, hoping they'd stay away from drugs and alcohol. Well, finally, he was converted, and we baptized him. And it about, probably about maybe six months after he was baptized, about 6 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from the guy who came on early down there uh, on, the, on WNXT every morning. And Bill called me up, and he said, Andy's down here drunk. Now, here's a guy that had been baptized, alcoholic, Whatever reason, he was now falling off the wagon. He was drunk as a skunk. And he said, I've got to, I got to go on the radio here in a few minutes. So I called Ernie Kennard. Ernie lived downtown. So Ernie goes up and picks up Andy. Then they come to the house and pick up me. And, and I said, Andy, uh, you need to go get dried out. He said, I'm, I'm not going anywhere till I get a drink. Because his hands were already shaking. He probably hadn't had anything to drink after midnight or whenever and I said I said what do you need he, and so over here on 23 just when you go uh, head up 23 there used to be a uh, whiskey store there Vince Tovine had a place there where they sold alcohol and so Ernie drives up there and I said Andy what, what do you have to have he said I, I need just some cheap wine. I said, okay, well, wh what kind? I don't know anything about wine. He said, get my wild Irish rose. Now, that's really good stuff. I said, what does it cost? He said, I think less than a dollar. It costs 69 cents for a little bottle. So I go in and get it. Now, here's your preacher going in there purchasing that. I take it out, and I give it to him, and he said, you'll have to open it for me. I, I can't hold it. So I, you know, did this, put it in both his hands, and, and, and I'm, I'm guessing, of course, I bet it wasn't 15 seconds until his hands were steady as a rock. It just took that much time for that stuff to get to his brain, I guess. And he said, okay, I'm ready to go to the apartment and get my clothes, and uh, I'll go to dry out, because that was up here at the hospital, the way you guys know, up here at the hospital at the time. Here's what you need to know. That was the last drink Andy ever had. It was bought by his preacher. And if I had to do it again, I'd do exactly the same thing. I was actually bad-mouthed in a couple of other local churches when they found out I had bought an alcoholic a drink. You see, we have tendency. Andy didn't quit being a Christian when he fell off the wagon. He was a Christian who was immature and weak and, and he, he didn't need criticism and judgment. He needed help. And we as a church need to understand that to, when we criticize, we don't intend to do anything except bad mouth. Andy stayed faithful until he died. He got cancer and he died. We buried him. And he's buried here in the county up east of Wheelersburg. In the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, there's reference there to a guy. Now, this guy was really bad. He was actually, the scripture said he was so bad that he embarrassed the, the, the non-Christians. He was, you know what he was doing? He was sleeping with his stepmother. Now, and so what did the church do? The church said, guys, we can't tolerate this, but here's what we'll do. We'll kick him out, but before we do, we'll tell him, this is to discipline you, hoping that you'll repent, quit what you're doing, and come back. 
the scripture indicates that that's exactly what happened. He repented of his sins, asked to be forgiven, came back before the church, confessed his sin, and they received him back. I call that extreme grace, for lack of a better term. We all are saved by grace. None of us have ever earned anything that would get us to heaven. But few of us had gotten to the place, the little church that I grew up in in Germantown, Kentucky, I don't think ever would have done that. And I doubt if I would, but I had some guys here who, were, who had been drunk themselves, and they kind of knew what to do. I, I'd never, you know, alcohol was never a problem for me. It was in my family, but it not for me. So the, the New Testament anticipated that those things would happen in the church. The New Testament anticipated that there would be circumstances in the church. We're not talking about people outside. We're talking about people who were born again believers in Jesus Christ will at times do something stupid and need forgiveness. And the New Testament says, especially there, if you go over to the third chapter of Colossians, verses 13 to 14, it says, I want you to be willing to forgive them just like God forgave you. See, I call that extreme grace. And it's, it, 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 takes a, it takes a mature believer to get to that place. But folks, that's what we were called to do. We were called to extend a hand rather than criticize. So the failures are, are, are always going to be there. If we have a revival and 100 people come in here, we're going to have all, we're even going to have probably some homosexual people. Because I know, I don't have to guess, I know that there are homosexuals who have come to Christ have left that lifestyle, gotten married, have children, and are doing wonderfully well. I can't, I can't use their names without their permission, and I'm going to have their permission. But I'm here to tell you, because we've had problems in our church here. We had a young girl that was really a good athlete that was seduced by her coach. And she thought, well, I'm homosexual now, and today... The last I heard, she was living in Oregon in a homosexual lifestyle. Any of you who have children who are in, uh, especially the girls I feel I hurt for more, please be careful with them because the homosexual people are really active among the girls in athletics. And, 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 I, and I, I can name a half a dozen probably from memory who have been seduced or have been uh, attacked by their coach. Please do not allow your little girls to be in a position where they're not chaperoned by people that you know and trust. Now, I hadn't intended to say that, but I, I, I'm glad I did. But I'll get letters. Now, what we need to understand, folks, is that the church when it functions as the Lord laid out for us, when we do more than just sit and put a few bucks in the bucket and go away, but when we actually are in the business of seeking the flow of the will of God and moving into that will and going on to it, the church is a thing of beauty and real joy. Let me tell you, you know, here's how you get... The scripture talks about there was joy among them. Where did that come from? Because they were in a horrible atmosphere. Where did that come from? Let's see if I can illustrate it this way. There were three of our boys growing up down in Germantown, Kentucky, metropolitan area of 150 people. Mother was a school teacher, and she was hard. She was a tough nut. She expected perfection, and you were punished if you, did, if you didn't get it. Our grades, when we came home, and my dad, he was the opposite. He didn't care about the, if, if he thought you were doing your best, that's good enough for him. He just got through the eighth grade, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. As a graduate of the eighth grade then, he was far ahead of many of them today who graduate from high school. 
that old codger, he, he, he was good in, in math and, and algebra and as, as a graduate of the eighth grade. And the worst I ever had him to say to me, the very worst that I ever had him to say to me was, uh, thought I taught you better than that. That's the badge of God. And he could look at you and go, uh, the game was over. And, the, the three, and, and with us three boys, the number one thing that we really wanted in life was to please our father. That was, you, you and mother, you're never going to please her. You, and, and she was a motor mouth. My, and if you want to know what it's like, sometime when Lou Ann's here, just follow her around. You know what that, that was like, because she's a motor mouth. And she was very bright and very, very demanding. I remember... When Alice Kay and I were talking about getting married, I was in the college over at Grace, and, and, and uh, Mother and Daddy came to a ball game before the Thanksgiving vacation, and Alice Kay, for the first time, was going to go to our house. And so we, they came up for the ball game. I was the kind of player that if I was hot, I could almost kick it in. I think in four years, I averaged like 17 points a game. And that was for the three-point thing. But when I was cold, I could stand on top, of the, on top of the blackboard and would have a hard time getting it to go in that hole. That night was one of those nights. We got in the car, and Mother said, you couldn't hit the barn with a brick bat. And, and Dad said, after Mother had said her piece, I thought you played a pretty decent game. That was the difference in the two. He was always, and he, he always wanted a little girl. The, when our first baby was born, and then the, the Greg, and then and number two came along, we lived down in Madisonville at, at, at Nebo, outside of Madisonville, Kentucky, while I was in school at Vanderbilt. And, uh, and our second baby was born. I called the house in Florida, and Daddy answered the phone. I said, Daddy, uh, Alice Kay had a baby last night. He said, she okay? I said, yeah, she's okay. I said, it was a boy. He said, well, I thought it would be. <laughs> that was how excited he was about, you know. And then the third one was a little girl, Lou Ann. And when we went to Florida one year on vacation, from the time we got there, he carried her all the time. And I doubt if he said two words. I doubt if he had a chance because she was a cha 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 And he would carry her everywhere and put her to bed at night, pick her up in the morning, take her, just carried her everywhere. He was that kind of easygoing, soft-spoken thing. And I say this without fear of contradiction. He probably loved Alice Kay more than he did me. But my goal in life was to hear that old guy say, you did good. I didn't drink, smoke some. I stayed a halfway decent kind of a teenager. Primarily, not because of the religious thing, but because I didn't want to disappoint my dad. Folks, what we're, what we're talking about here, and whenever he said, hey, you did good, boy, I could almost have cold chills. What I'm telling you is when our relationship with our Heavenly Father is intimate and real, and we know that we have, are actually being used by Him to carry out His will in the world which we're living, and ultimately with the promise of hearing Him say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. That's going to be one heck of a day. And yet that possibility is available for us all. But we have to get ourselves committed to seeking first the kingdom of God, moving ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit and the encouragement of other believers in the flow of the will of God, with the promise of knowing that when we stand before God, we stand before Him with the assurance of saying, you did good, boy. You did good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that through the, the gift of the Holy Spirit 
and a determination on our part to do your will. An anticipation of the great joy that's beyond understanding. The glory of hearing you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, is something we really look forward to. Help us, O oh God, as a fellowship of believers to move in that direction. And thank you for giving us the help we need. We offer you our gratitude in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for coming on this anniversary celebration. You're free to go. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.